Welcome to the Clear Ground Show. I'm your host, Dr. G, with a PhD. I hope everyone's weekend was excellent. We have a lot of things to cover today. So first, I'm going to start off with an example of two drugs that are really, really similar, and one of which was banned by the FDA and the other we still use today. And this is just an example um, from last week when I was talking about how the FDA approved the Moderna vaccine uh, because of its similarity to Pfizer. So this is an example of why we shouldn't be doing that. Then we'll go straight into the LA health system, what they're re recommending now for LA. We'll talk about New York cases. We're going to talk about Bremen in Germany and their caseload for COVID. We'll talk about Rochelle Walensky. She has an interview with Fox News, and it doesn't go as planned for her. Um, Canada says no to vaccine mandates, parts of Canada. A British doctor goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Secretary of Health. We've got back-to-back -back Houston stories, the first one being a woman puts a child in a trunk because he tests positive for COVID. That's kind of crazy. And then the uh, Texas courts side with Houston on mask mandates or potential mask mandates. Then speaking about masks, we're going to talk about an old article from 2018 in San Francisco. We'll see what they have to say about masks. Both AOC and Whoopi have COVID. We'll see what implications that have. And finally, I'll give a brief argument as to why I think we should be testing less rather than more in this COVID era. Let's dive on in. So small side note, I don't know how many of you noticed, but uh, there was no ding uh, after the Dr. G part last episode. That's because I updated my computer and I couldn't find the ding. I couldn't find the bell. Well, here it is, that sweet, sweet. Now that's the good stuff. But now onto the comparison of these drugs. So just recapping real quick from that letter of authorization last year, here's what the FDA said about Moderna and Pfizer's vaccines. Quoting right now, Although the overall composition of the Moderna COVID-19 vaccine is different than the Pfizer BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine, both are mRNA vaccines with safety and efficacy profiles that, though not identical, are relatively similar. I noted at the time that's not how we usually operate, and here is a classic example that one of my esteemed colleagues sent to me, and it's a first-year problem uh, in pharmacy schools and medical schools, and it's the difference between Bextra and Celebrex. So both of these drugs are non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, or NSAIDs. I'm sure you guys have heard the, that name before. And what makes this case study so great is that they both have the same mechanism of action. So remember, mechanism of action is how the drug actually works in your body to produce the desired effect. In this case, both of their mechanisms of action are selective inhibition of cyclooxygenase 2, otherwise known as COX-2. So even with the same mechanism of action and the same desired outcome, they're both anti-inflammatory drugs, um, Celecoxib, which is Celebrex, is still on the market right now in the U.S., whereas Valdecoxib, which is Bextra, was withdrawn in 2005 due to increased cardiovascular risk. Now, keep in mind, they both actually have cardiovascular risk. Bextra in 2005 was shown to have several reactions that were extremely adverse, and some of those resulted in fatalities. For this reason, the U.S. FDA pulled it from the market. So it's important to remember a couple of things. One, everything has a cost. Every drug you put into your body, there is a reaction, there's a cost, there are always going to be potential side effects, and in some part of the population, that will, those side effects will manifest. So it's always a risk-reward. It's just usually we're very good at mitigating that risk, which is great. And the other thing is, this is exactly why we should test every drug. It doesn't matter how similar they are or how, like they said, relatively similar they are because there could be adverse effects that we don't know. We're, our, our understanding of human biology and toxicology is still at its infancy, infancy rel relative to other, um, other sciences. So for example, back in, in my schooling in toxicology, one thing that we always heard was, if you look at a car in 1918, like a Ford Model T, and then you look at a Ferrari nowadays, huge difference. You look at planes, the Wright brothers 100 years ago, planes today, huge difference. Toxicology 100 years ago, mice and rats. Toxicology today, for the most part, mice, mice and rats. Now, we are moving into other models, but it's still we're still learning quite a bit. And so when we make these new drugs, we're always finding new things that can go wrong and new things that go right. But that's a way to test everything. And so when the FDA just so callously makes this assumption in the letter of authorization, yeah, it's not a good sign, guys. 
Now stopping by uh, LA to see what their new public health mandates are. And this comes in light of Omicron. And this was released January 5th. Um, basically, because Omicron is so prevalent, um, as soon as possible, but no later than January 17th, employers are required to provide their employees who work indoors in close contact with others with well-fitting medical grade masks, surgical masks, or higher level respirators such as N95 or KN95 masks. These upgraded masks are better at blocking virus particles from going through the mask. Okay, so they updated that. They updated the threshold of people that can go into venues. They worked on talking about where you can eat and drink in these venues and how the venues are responsible. They noted that today, and that was January 5th, 27 people died from COVID-19 and there were 26,754 new cases. Of those 27 deaths, 24 were over the age of 50, and of the 27 deaths, 18 had underlying health conditions, according to this statement. Lastly, public health identified a total of 1,806,828 positive cases of COVID-19 across all areas of LA County, and the positivity rate of January 5th was 22.4%. In short, the masks are back, baby. Speaking of cases, I'm going to touch on New York City real quick, because I said I was going to last Friday, and Governor Holchel just released all the New York data. Now that link to the New York State Health Office is in the description, so you guys can go check it out and read the full thing. I took the data and put it into basically a spreadsheet so you can see it much easier here. And here are the different regions of New York. Um, and on the top, across the x-axis on top, it has COVID-19 patients currently hospitalized, then those admitted due to COVID or COVID or complications of COVID. And then they have the percentage. So the percentage of those admitted due to COVID or complications of COVID of the total number. Then they had the admitted where COVID was not included as one of the reasons for admission. So incidental COVID findings. And the only one I'm going to highlight here, but you guys can check out the rest, is New York City. So New York City had 49% of all of those admitted due to COVID or COVID complications and 51% were incidental. Uh, the reason why I focus on New York City is because, well, honestly, everyone's been focusing on New York City. The other sections of New York are important and they're more rural. And in the more rural areas, you'll notice that the percentages are a lot higher. The numbers are usually lower, I mean, the raw numbers, I mean. Um, so, you know, like Mohawk Valley has 133 COVID-19 patients hospitalized uh, versus New York's 6,000. So here's that data for you guys to check out. And I will update you on more things that I find out as I find them out in terms of New York and cases in general. But touching on cases internationally, I want to take one look at a German state in its uh, Omicron spike. And this comes from Reuters. The northern German maritime state of Bremen has the country's highest COVID-19 vaccination rate by far, but it has become the hardest hit by the rapid spread of the Omicron variant, reporting the highest infection rate of any, any region in Germany. Experts say that the spike in Bremen could herald where Germany as a whole is heading in the coming days. The seven-day infection rate in Bremen stood at 800 cases per 100,000 residents on Thursday, the highest in Germany and more than double the national rate of 303, according to the Robert Koch Institute for Infectious Diseases. Now, this is a quote, I assume that Bremen is just a little further ahead than other federal states, end quote, said Hajo Zeeb of the Leibniz Institute for Prevention, Research, and Epidemiology in Bremen. Close to 84% of the population in Bremen, which is the smallest of Germany's 16 federal states and it has fewer than 700,000 people, are double vaccinated compared with a national figure of around 72%. Some, 44%, have received a booster shot compared with 42% nationally. Bremen is also a somewhat more accurate representation of the actual figures in Germany because coronavirus testing there did not slow during the holiday season as it did in many other regions, uh, Zeeb added. Despite the record infection rate in Bremen, the state's hospitals were not as burdened as they were in the first three waves of the pandemic as patients infected with the new variant were coming in with milder symptoms, said Lucas Furman, who's the spokesperson for Bremen's Health Senate. It's great news that the hospital burden is less with this variant. That's really good news. And at a certain point, these countries are going to have to just move on. They're going to have to get on with their lives and learn to live with COVID and it being endemic. Now, I'm going to talk more about that in the testing section at the very end. Um, but hey, great news that this variant has a lower hospitalization rate than others. Now, let's look at a video of Dr. Walensky being interviewed on Fox News by Brett Baer. You, know, you just heard about the U.S. Supreme Court currently deciding the fate of the president's vaccine mandates. In the questioning, Justice Sonia Sotomayor made this statement. We have over 100,000 children, which we've never had before, in, in serious condition, and uh, many on ventilators. Now, as we can find from Friday, suggests there are fewer than 3,500 current pediatric hospitalizations from COVID-19. Is that true? 
Yeah, but, you know, here's what I can tell you about our pediatric hospitalizations now. First of all, the vast majority of children who are in the hospital are unvaccinated. And for those children who are not eligible for vaccination, we do know that they are most likely to get sick with COVID if their family members aren't vaccinated. So the most important thing we can do for those children to keep them out of the hospital is to vaccinate them and to vaccinate their family members around them. Understood. But the we number is not 100,000. It's roughly 3,500 in hospitals now. It, yes, there are, there are. And in fact, what I will say is while pediatric hospitalizations are rising, they're still about 15 fold less than hospitalizations of our older age, age demographic. So a couple of things from this clip. The first one is, um, so it's unclear. So at least when I heard it, um, Justice Sotomayor, so she was talking about the 100,000 kids in hospitals. You could read or you could hear what she said and maybe think uh, she's talking about the whole time. But also at the very end, she kind of incriminates herself because she says, well, this new variant. And so it's hard to tell if she meant the 100,000 over the course of COVID or over this particular variant. And you could read it either way. Um, although I think if you read it the way that Brett Baer's team is reading it right now, that's absolutely correct. And even if you read it raw numbers just over the entire time, you don't reach 100,000 kids in the hospital because of COVID and you don't see many on ventilators. But the other point real quick is it seems almost like now Fauci and Walensky are contradicting each other a little bit. If you guys remember a couple of episodes ago, we played Fauci talking about hospitalizations in children and he said, well, many of them are incidental. It's that they're in the hospital. Hospitals have strict testing requirements so everyone gets tested and their test turns up positive, but they're not symptomatic or they're not sick, so sick with symptoms they have to be hospitalized. They're in the hospital for a broken leg or something else. Now let's do one more quick clip before moving on. Do you know how many of the 836,000 deaths in the U.S. linked to COVID are from COVID or how many are with COVID but they had other comorbidities? Do you have that breakdown? Um, yes, of course, with Omicron, we're following that very carefully. Our death registry, of course, um, takes a few weeks to and is, uh, takes a few weeks to collect. Um, and of course, Omicron has just been with us for a few weeks, but those data will be forthcoming. So she says, yes, of course, and then proceeds to present no data. So what do I think that's going to happen? I think once the CDC starts releasing these numbers and they start releasing them in the same way that New York's uh, Kathy Hochul did, it's going to be a huge blow to the COVID narrative. And we're going to see a lot of people saying, OK, I'm done with these mandates. I'm done with these masks. I'm, do I'm done with all of it. Um, but we'll, we'll see what happens. But I, I have a feeling that that's where this is going to go. Speaking of people that are done with it, grid news for Canada, or at least parts of Canada, both the Saskatchewan premier and the Alberta premier said that they're going to refuse federal suggestions of mandatory vaccines. That's a step in the right direction, Canada. Kudos. Now, a lot of people talk about speaking truth to power, and this video that I'm about to show actually is that exact thing, speaking truth to power. This is a British doctor going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Sajid Javid, the UK's health uh, secretary, on COVID vaccine mandates. What do you, what do you think of the, the new rule to require vaccination of all NHS staff? I'm, I'm not happy about that. So. You're not happy about it, tell no. me. So I've had COVID at some point. Yeah. Uh, I've got antibodies. Yeah. Um, I've been working on COVID ITU since the beginning. Yeah. I have not had a vaccination. I did not want to have a vaccination. Um, uh, the vaccine is reducing transmission only for about eight weeks yeah. with Delta. With Omicron, it's probably less. Yeah. And for that, I would be dismissed if I don't have a vaccine. It's not the science isn't strong enough. That's your view. And, and, and your views? Do you have any view on that? I, that, I respect that, but there's, a, there's also a many cases uh, I agree, there's different views. Yeah, there's other views, yeah. but... Yeah. And there's another yeah. colleague yeah. Who's, who's also in the same position. Yeah. Yeah. No, I understand that. And obviously we had to weigh all that up for both health and social care. And there, there Ouch. So the full video, is, the link to the full video is in the description. You guys want to see the whole thing. And he goes through a couple of things, and the science is definitely, like they said, debatable. Um, but at least they go through it and they, they, have, they duke it out. And what's interesting and actually great to see is that even though I don't agree with Javid, for example, he actually goes to the hospital and he listens to criticism. I mean, he doesn't have a good retort or a good comeback or any of that, but he goes and listens to him, and that deserves credit. And now people need to see that and act on that. that that's important. So it's, it's not just the courage to go do it. 
and the courage of this doctor to say his position, especially in times like these. But now that the people see it, they need to act on it. Also, just one point, it was kind of awkward when he approached those nurses, wasn't it? They were all silent. They looked around. Uh, that was that was that was not promising. In terms of crazy COVID stories, Houston, Texas takes the cake for this episode. Let's hear from local news station KHOU, and then we'll discuss afterwards. Well, we are outside Cypress Falls High School. This is where Cypher ISD says Sarah Beam, a mother, is charged with endangering her 13-year-old son, taught but now is on administrative leave. According to court documents, Beam had her son in the trunk of her car when she went to get a COVID test. She says she had him in the car, according to those documents, because he had COVID and she was trying to distance herself. Now, we did try to knock on her door. We were told that she wasn't there. We don't know her whereabouts right now, but we know a warrant has been issued for her arrest as we continue to work to get more information. Holy smokes, that is crazy. So I went to the KHOU website for a little more information. Um, and like they said, a warrant has been issued for this Houston area mom. She put her son in the trunk of her car after he tested positive for COVID-19. According to authorities, the woman was in line to get a COVID test. She has subsequently been charged with endangering a child. So according to Sergeant Richard Standifer the, with the Texas Department of Public Safety, I have never heard of somebody being put in a trunk because they tested positive for anything. The most interesting part to me is that like the last half of this article focuses on the danger of putting a kid in a trunk. But it, the article doesn't really focus at all on this psychosis of what just happened here. This woman was so afraid of COVID or so afraid of something that she literally put her child in a trunk because he tested positive. That's the story here. Yes, of course, putting someone in the trunk of a car is dangerous because trunks are crumple zones or whatever. And that kid could get hurt if she gets to wreck. That's true. And I'm not trying to say that that's not true. But this article should have focused instead on why this woman did this. People are going crazy with this testing thing and what the test implicates and the morality of it all. And like we've been discussing for, for months now, um, this, is a, this is a really interesting mental change in our nation. And we have, to, we have to come out strong against this. And I think a way to really change mentality is through our, our how we view testing. And I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end today. Another story from Houston, well, Harris County in general, and that is that state the state appeals court hold, upholds Harris County mask mandate against Governor Greg Abbott's ban. Harris County can continue imposing mask requirements following a Texas state appeals court ruling that decided against Governor Greg Abbott's attempt to ban mask mandates by local governments. The Texas Third Court of Appeals in Austin Thursday upheld a previous lower court ruling issued in August. Justices in the opinion argued that Abbott exceeded his authority by prohibiting local governments from mandating face coverings to prevent the spread of COVID-19. The governor does not possess absolute authority under the Texas Disaster Act to preempt orders issued by local governmental entities or officials that contradict his executive orders, the opinion said. County Judge Lena Hidalgo, in a news conference following the ruling Thursday, called the decision a victory for public health and affirms the authority of local health officials to put measures in place to control the spread of coronavirus. Now quoting from Hidalgo, but it's just another battle in our fight against COVID-19. From day one, the cultural wars of COVID-19 have had deadly consequences. Too many people have been lost to this virus who didn't have to die simply because the misinformation and the politicization and the cultural wars surrounding the virus has made it easier to spread. The decision also allows the county to provide clear guidance amid a surge in cases in the region due to the highly contagious Omicron variant, Hidalgo says. On Tuesday, she announced the county is considering raising the threat level to red in response to rocketing COVID-19 positivity in the area. Hidalgo said businesses and schools can continue requiring masks and encourage them to do so. Quote, unless a Texas Supreme Court rules against this and they won't make a, they won't make a rule for a while, you're within your rights to continue with those requirements, she said, adding the ruling is expected to be appealed to the Texas Supreme Court. We'll see where this goes. We'll also see how many people actually follow any of these mask mandates that she puts in place for Harris County. Speaking of masking and reasonable thinking, I found this article from 2018 from the San Francisco Gate, and the title of the article is, Wait, Kids and People with Breathing Problems Should Not Wear N95 Masks. This article was in response to the wildfires, but the principles remain the same, and you'll see what I mean in a second. So from the opening paragraph, this week, public health agencies released such conflicting guidance that only after two interviews and reading five different advisories on mask usage do we feel even remotely confident we can make sense of this in a way that can inform the public. So here it goes. At this point, they list several different things on masks. I'm going to read a couple of them, but I highly encourage everyone to go to the descriptions and read this link. 
and just look at what they had to say in 2018. So again, from the California Department of Public Health, scarves, bandanas, tissues, and anything not marked N95 or better are not helpful. Surgical masks that trap small particles are designed to filter air coming out of the wearer's mouth and do not provide a good seal to prevent inhalation of small particles or gases in the smoke. Where have I heard that before? Hmm, about the surgical masks. Small children should not wear masks, California Department of Public Health points out. Children should not wear these masks. They do not fit properly and can impede breathing. If the air quality is poor enough that a child requires a mask, the child should remain indoors in a safe place and evacuations should be considered. And another one, people with beards shouldn't wear masks. The air is, is going to come from around the edges and not be filtered anyway. And the mask will then just make breathing hard with no real filtering. Of course, you could wear a half or full face mask like was used for asbestos removal, but this seems pretty drastic. So this is a great article. They have lots of interviews with lots of medical professionals. They offer good ideas and good tidbits, and it's reasonable. It's a reasonable conversation on masks, and I think a lot of the principles apply to today. Now let's check in on Whoopi from The View. They tested me and it was like, oh no, you're not, you're not coming back. <laughs> We're not sending anybody to your house. You have corona. And it was like, wait, what? <laughs> what? It was a, it was a shock because you know I'm triple vaxxed. I haven't been anywhere. I haven't done anything. But that's the that's the thing about the Omicron. You just don't know where it is. You don't know where it is. Who's got it? Who's passing it? So you know, it's one of those things where you think I've done everything I was supposed to do. Yeah, it doesn't it doesn't um, it doesn't stop Omicron? She's almost there. Almost the right idea. So she did everything right, got COVID, she's triple vaxxed, we know triple vax can pass the virus's transmission can happen. So now what? There's two decisions you can make. One, continue castigating half the population, or two, admit that, hey, okay, I got it, it's not that bad, I'm vaccinated, you're not, whatever, whatever, everyone can get it, let's just live our lives. I don't think she's going to go to that conclusion, but she should. She laid out the whole argument in that statement. In other news of media darlings that have acquired COVID in the last week, AOC, after traveling to Florida, which she castigates all the time, has Omicron. She has committed the modern sin of catching Omicron. So I hope she recovers well. So far, the, the case is mild, but she has it. Is she going to get castigated by, the, by, by her side of the aisle? Is she going to get castigated by New Yorkers? Is anyone going to get mad at her? My guess is probably not. Does she deserve people to get mad at her? Yes, of course she does. It's just the whole thing is crazy. Um, and I, I hope that all these acquired infections by all of these different people are going to wake people up and say, OK, look, we get it. These policies aren't doing anything about acquiring infection. Let's just move on from this stage of the pandemic and just make it endemic and live our lives. So now I'm going to give my opinions on testing and you know how I think we can change our mindset and again, it's the same as with my opinion on vaccines. Um, I'm trying to convince through reasoning and rationality why we should change our view on so much testing. I'm not for forcing people to not be able to get tests. I think if you want to test, you should be able to go get one. But I think we should change our mindset around testing. And with that, let me give you a few reasons why. So first of all, why do we test in medicine? Typically, people test in medicine to perform interventions or, or to prevent things. So for example, Say you wake up one morning and you feel really sick, you know you've got this cough, you got congestion, you might go get a flu test to see if you have the flu. And if you have the flu, there's a certain intervention you take, maybe Tamiflu if it's early enough, and if not, you go and monitor. Now, for COVID, what would the intervention be? So if you, for the vast, vast majority of people, especially with Omicron, if you test positive for COVID, the intervention is the exact same as if you never tested for COVID. And what is that? Basically, you stay home, rest, relax, and recuperate. It's just like in 2019, when we were sick, we didn't go to work, we didn't want to get people sick, we took sick days, we didn't hang out with friends, we didn't want to get them sick, we just chilled and got better. And that's going to be the intervention, if you want to call it that, for the vast majority of healthy younger people. So I don't think those people need to test every time they get a sneeze. So when I'm seeing these long lines of people waiting to get tested, either in cars or outside, uh, something that strikes me is, if you have to wait a half hour in line, or in some cases, hours in line, to tell if you're super sick with an infection like COVID, either you aren't that sick or you're taking massive risks in infecting everyone else in that line. It just doesn't make that much sense to me. So my next point is simply that we have limited resources. We only have so many tests. Like We only have so many of everything. We live in a finite world. 
again, I'm not trying to say no one should, should be able to get a test. You should be able to get a test, but let's be more prudential about getting our tests. So I think we should primarily save tests for those who really need it, for those that are really symptomatic and really sick and need their results super quickly so that we can do interventions super quickly depending on what they're sick with. So if we, if we kind of take a chill pill on getting everyone tested, then we're going to have those tests available for those who need it. Not only that, it'll decrease the time of their test to get returned to them so they can act even quicker. It'll also decrease the chances of error in terms of losing the test or getting or the company mixing and matching whose test results are for who. The large amount of testing is also no doubt making an interesting statement on our positivity rate in terms of multiple people testing multiple times in a week. So if you test four times in one week for whatever reason you decide to test that many times in that week and those four become positive, that's four positive registries in the positive cases. So Omicron is already super contagious. Some people are saying it's as contagious as measles, which is insane. So by adding all these tests in people that might be asymptomatic or show very minimal symptoms, we're artificially increasing the already high rate of positivity for COVID in the U.S. And again, for most of these people, the intervention is going to be what it would have been had you not tested. If you feel sick, stay home and don't don't go out. Now on to workplace testing culture. So a lot of workplaces have put in place a lot of these testing measures to go back to work. I don't think we should be revolving around these tests. So for example, Omicron has shown to be the most contagious of all the variants so far. And you're contagious at two to three days before symptoms, as well as two days immediately after symptoms. Those are your most, that's the most contagious window. So if you've been contagious for the two to three days before showing symptoms, and you've been going to work those two or three days, all of a sudden a positive test, which might take a day to get back to you anyways, is going to mean that you've been at work for four fifths of the most contagious part of Omicron. This means, and I think we're seeing this, that these rules are going to work with the positive test and how they're determining the days are doing actually very little to mitigate the spread of Omicron. So in closing, I know this has been a long episode, sorry about that guys, but in closing, a big way to return to normal is to stop revolving our lives around tests, especially tests for COVID. One last time, if you want a test, you should be able to get one, but we should stop just desiring tests for any general function in society especially with Omicron. By doing this, not only will it give us more peace of mind as a society, it'll also allow us to focus our efforts and our resources on those that are most vulnerable. And when COVID hits those hard, we'll be able to take care of them faster and better. And with that, we're going to wrap this episode up. That was a long episode, guys. Thanks for sticking with me till the end. I'll be trying something new at the end of this week. I'm going to do a mailbag. So if you guys have any questions concerning toxicology or the politicization of science, it could be miscellaneous things like hobbies or sports, um, even philosophy. Just let me know what question you guys have, and I'll try to answer it briefly on Friday in our mailbag. And as usual, please tell all your friends, like this show, have them subscribe. Let's get more reasonable conversation out there. Check out the Instagram for all the thumbnails in high quality. Please enjoy this video, and I'll see you guys again on Wednesday.